Hello there and welcome to the Construction Revolution podcast. My name is Ali Alizadeh and here on the show we explore the latest trends, technologies, people and organizations that are revolutionizing or disrupting the construction industry and are changing what the industry will look like tomorrow. We're thrilled to present a special edition of the Construction Revolution podcast featuring an exclusive panel discussion that took place at the highly anticipated Net Zero Construction Conference in March 2023. The panel titled Building for a Green Future brought together some of the brightest minds in the industry who are passionate about driving sustainability and innovation in the construction sector. Today, you'll hear from Dr. Eric Giannini, Director of Product Standards and Technology at PCA, Dr. Hassam Azari Jafari, Deputy Director of Concrete Sustainability Hub at MIT, Greg Geek, President and Co-Founder of PCMI Corp, Julie Buffenbarger, Senior Scientist and Sustainability Principal at Beton Consulting Engineers, Huria Gotz, Co-Founder and CEO at Geotech, and myself, Ali Aliza Day, Co-Founder and President and CTO at Geotech. Get ready to be inspired by the insights and ideas of these experts as they explore the future of green construction and share their vision for a more sustainable built environment. If you find this panel as inspiring and informative as we did, be sure to follow the Net Zero Construction Conference on LinkedIn. By doing so, you won't miss out on your chance to attend the next Net Zero Construction Conference happening in 2024. Hello and welcome everyone to our panel discussion on building for a green future as part of the third Net Zero Construction Conference. My name is Ali Aliza, the CTO in Geotech, and I will be moderating this panel today. It's a great pleasure to host a Berlin group of experts from technology companies, consulting engineering, research academia, and industry associations who will bring different perspectives on the opportunities and challenges in the development of a green and more sustainable future. For the audience, if you have any questions, please share them in the chat area. So without further ado, let's start with the introductions and find out more about our panelists before we dive into the discussions. Eric? Yeah, good morning. Uh, my name is Eric Giannini. I'm the Director of Product Standards and Technology for the Portland Cement Association. We're an industry association that represents cement manufacturers in the United States, as well as uh, companies that also produce products for the cement manufacturing industry. Uh, my particular role, I spend a lot of time working on uh, the standard needs of the industry. So, uh, for example, what is a Portland limestone cement and how do we define that? And if we're trying, trying to make improvements to that product, um, how would we define that in a standard format? So that is that's my key role. Thank you, Eric, and welcome to the panel. Hessa. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Hessam Azar Jafari, and I'm a research scientist and deputy director of the MIT Concrete Sustainability Hub. Uh, my background is on industrial ecology uh, with a little bit of flavor on construction engineering and management. And here at the Concrete Sustainability Hub, we are uh, mostly focusing on research on how to achieve carbon neutrality in the construction industry and how to be more resilient and how to evaluate uh, the resilience of our built environment in general. And also we are working on asset management topics, uh, how to achieve the most out of the dollar values that we spend on our infrastructure systems. Glad to be here and talk to you all. Thank you, Sam, and welcome. Uh, Greg. Hi, my name is Craig Yake. I'm with BMC, BCMI Corporation. BCMI is a collective between several dozen producers of materials, concrete, aggregate asphalt, and cement in the US and beyond and sharing the risk and cost of bringing modern tools to the industry. We're a SaaS-based platform covering every aspect of the industry from CRM through dispatch through billing. Um, BCMI is now eight years old and we're finally coming out from under the radar, and which is a wonderful thing. And we look forward to our next venture, which is deep into AI and changing how we fundamentally dispatch concrete. Thank you. Amazing, and th thanks and welcome, uh, Greg. Uh, last but not least, uh, Puria. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Puria Dodds, uh, co-founder and CEO currently at Geotech Scientific. So yeah, so we've been working uh, at Geotech over the past 13 years, actually. <laughs> 
this year, yeah, because 13 years and building the IoT sensor uh, for measurement of concrete properties, right? So yeah, strength, temperature or other uh, characteristics of concrete and we are hoping leveraging, you know, like AI as Greg, Greg mentioned, right? So to use that data, right? So measurement data to bring uh, efficiency to, to concrete industry, right? So by make, make, making mixes more efficient, reducing their carbon footprint and uh, yeah that that's something we have been working over the past 10 years but we have had some pivot along the way you know working uh, starting from NDT devices sensor lines and now we are working on the mix optimization right so that uh, mix management of, and mix optimization in concrete industry and very glad to be here today Julie hi I'm Julie Buffenbarger I'm with Baton Consulting Engineers I also work for a ready mix company in Cleveland, Ohio as their QAQC manager and sustainability manager. I have a very diverse background, maybe in comparison to some of the panelists, as I have spent 12 years with an, an international admixture company, another 13 years with a cement manufacturer, again, a global player. And now I've done more consulting and again, looking at a perspective from the ready mix uh, construction and also ready mix producer. Thank you, Julian. Welcome to this panel. Uh, thanks everyone again uh, for joining today's panel discussion. Let's just start uh, with our first topic. Uh, job sites are one of the key areas in the construction ecosystem where we can implement green practices. Uh, this could cover materials, processes, uh, labor, uh, and so on and so forth. So perhaps we can start with discussing the importance of sustainability on job sites. It's obviously not disconnected from the rest of the ecosystem, but it, it's where it all uh, is, uh, is happening at the end of the day. So Eric, um, are there guidelines or specifications that support the implementation of green practices uh, in job sites or construction? Uh, certainly there are uh construction specifications that play a big role in what we build and how we build. Uh, these are instructions to the contractor that often tell them uh, what the owner wants in the end, but sometimes they also get very prescriptive in terms of how to do the construction. So the more that we can uh, move towards performance-based specifications, we can give the contractors more flexibility to implement green construction practices and, and be innovative uh, with regards to how they're building. Um, and then also there are uh, specifications for different types of cements that we're used to using uh, for concrete construction. So um, more recently, we've seen a growth in the use of Portland limestone cements in the United States and Canada. Um, this was something that was began as a research and development effort about 20 years ago, eventually got into product standards. Um, but even from that point forward, it was a long, uh, roughly eight, eight to 10 year effort to get this into construction specifications, um, both at the government level for state departments of transportation and provincial uh, departments of transportation uh, and uh, into commercial specifications. And that has taken a lot of effort and a lot of time to get these materials um, accepted so that they're even an option for use on construction. Yeah, thank you, Eric. Um, so is it, is it actually interesting to, I mean, this is the perspective from the, um, I guess, uh, association and guidelines and specifications. On the other end of it, uh, it's happening at the research level, I think uh, maybe Hassam. Um, where do you see the direction of research in this area moving? You know, and, are there any important areas that needs to be further evaluated, you know, if you're looking at sustainability implementations on job sites at the end of the day? Absolutely. So as Eric mentioned, there is a great momentum among the uh, construction stakeholders to achieve carbon neutrality, to be more sustainable, majorly because of the needs in our society. And uh, here we definitely need to have a plan to move forward with that. Uh, we saw uh, great efforts from different uh, organizations and associations uh, like um, Global Cement and Concrete Associations or uh, Portland Cement Association on defining different types of uh, frameworks and roadmap to achieve carbon neutrality and moving forward. Uh, they have identified many different levers and solutions to uh, move towards a more sustainable or low carbon uh, cement and concrete or construction in general. 
Um, the direction of research in this area is to well, generally divide it to two major um, categories. One is the experimental work that we see around uh, uh, concrete or other construction materials uh, to produce uh, a concrete with better performance and lower carbon emissions. And the second part is the analytical aspects to measure the carbon performance of the construction activities. And uh, different stakeholders, including builders, designers, uh, contractors, or even the material suppliers uh, uh, are working uh, with the researchers to address uh, the pressing questions around carbon performance of the concrete construction. Thank you, Sam. And Rick, you have seen it all. Uh, in your experience over the past decades, uh, you know how have this topic and att attention to it has changed? You're on mute. Sorry about that. First, I'd like to mention that Hassam has been nominated for the 2022 NRMCA Innovators Award. It's quite a distinction. Innovators like Hassam are critical to making our industry more sustainable. Congratulations. Now, at the job, important factors go well beyond environmental. They include social responsibility, regulatory compliance, reputation, and in some cases, an economic benefit for becoming more green. Environmental is the big item, no doubt. Construction greatly impacts the environment, including greenhouse gas emissions, general pollution, and resource depletion, which shouldn't be overlooked. Social responsibility, and its direct impact on a company's professional relationships are increasingly recognized as a factor for winning business. It remains a lesser influence, but regulatory oversight is now an essential element of competitive bidding in specific geographies. So in general, economic benefits are possible and require coordination, especially with the regulatory and total lifetime costs, which is a key issue. If immediate build cost is the focus, sustainable practices are a really hard sell in our industry. Once we transition to the full infrastructure life cycle, there's ample room for economic benefits of sustainability. The reality is this will require regulation, which is often frowned upon by our business community. So overall, there's it's a multifaceted influence on the job site. And I'm sure we're gonna be drilling down into that much more as we go here. Thank you, Greg. Um, and Puri, uh, what are the biggest sustainability trends that you see emerging today and how important it is to focus on them? Yeah, no, uh, yeah, maybe, maybe uh, from, from different angles, right? So uh, just different lens. Uh, in construction industry, right? So I believe uh, total uh, emission we have, right? GHD emission is around 11%, 12%, right? So construction industry. but. Perhaps the majority of this, right, eight percent, you know, give or take, seven to eight percent, is coming from concrete industry. I guess the the low hanging fruit, right, so general or the the biggest opportunity for reducing the carbon footprint or environmental impact, or maybe a biggest opportunity to be more sustainable. I believe uh, stays in, I mean, is in the concrete industry, right? So it's a bigger opportunity compared to other other aspects of construction. But yeah, if if we consider that, perhaps uh, I would say concrete is is really really like a great opportunity to basically for for adoption of the new technology or uh, doing a different or using different materials even right so different sources of material to, in this industry to make it more uh, sustainable. But but uh, it, it, even within concrete industry, what I've seen that I mean over the past ten years at least. Uh, the, the solutions or technology that are not co extra cost at extra cost or are more cost effective, right? For example, SCM, right? As Eric mentioned, as uh, uh, supplementary cementitious material like a slag and flyage has been adopted faster because there, there was no extra cost or ex significant extra cost, right? For for in trade for in, uh, in, as a trade off for for sustainability right so I believe that those technology are, that are not adding significant cost to this industry would be more uh, basically promising for in terms of the adoption or or creating a bigger impact right compared to more costly technologies. Thank you, Priya. Julie, uh, in your experience, how often do clients ask for sustainability aspects, and why would this be important to them? 
Well, I am not seeing in the Midwest a lot of requests for sustainability per se. However, I am telling you it is coming. I work with clients all over the United States, and certainly my clients on the West Coast are asking actually for us to write new specifications about low carbon concrete. Also to look at their specifications and ask how it may change. Now, when I say that, one of my clients is a producer and or is a contractor rather, and he is really very forward thinking and that they want to be the most sustainable construction group in the US. And in doing so, they're asking a lot of questions that are very, very important today. Not only do we see here in my market, and like I said, more on the United States level, we're talking about sustainability in terms of environmental product declarations, in terms of what is a low car carbon concrete mixture. But there's more to sustainability than just those two items. What I see lacking today is the looking at construction in a different way as far as we need to also be monitoring waste. We also need to be monitoring water. And many of my colleagues don't equate that in sustainability. The second part of this is why they look at things economically, they may not look at things from that societal aspect is, how are my construction projects influencing positively or detrimentally the social group in which this structure will be? So I think we are starting to see a change but in my opinion, some of it is not quick enough or it's not complete enough. Thank you. It is not pretty clear that we need to add a sustainability issues in the construction industry. But as we go through this transition and uh, we, we are adopting technologies in the construction industry that are geared towards sustainability, there are obstacles and risks that have to be addressed. Uh, Eric. What are the challenges do you see from the perspective of the standard associations and guidelines uh, in this area? Well, I think the biggest challenge is inertia and overcoming inertia. We have done things a certain way a long time in the industry, and um, it's, it's a slow to change industry. So the biggest challenge with inertia is it's going to take us somewhere, but it's not going to take us where we need to go. Um, we also have to get a lot of different stakeholders on board. And when you're in a standards organization, everybody has a say in these consensus standards. So the people that make the products have a say, people that use the products have a say, uh, general interest folks like Hassam, who are just uh, academics have a say. And that can mean a slow process towards uh, achieving consensus on these standards. Um, so it's not enough for just an engineer to want to affect change on in construction. It's not enough for just a contractor or even the owner. Everybody really has to be on board. Um, the other part of this, too, I think, is that this is a big energy issue. We're talking about, um, this is getting a little away from standards, but we're talking about fossil to renewable transitions, electric, sorry, electrification, and the need to get energy where it needs to be when we need it there. Um, because a lot of the pathways and a lot of the levers that we're eventually trying to pull are going to involve um, not using fossil fuel for a lot of things. And we have to be able to use electricity the instant that it's made. Um, so there's, there's a lot that needs to be done in that area and it's completely out of our hands. Um, but it's going to affect everything that we do, whether we have uh, you know, electric vehicles on job sites, uh, battery powered tools, um, being able to make concrete in a, a net zero way. And, and finally, you know, from a standard perspective too, we're trying to introduce new materials. It can be something as uh, small of a change as Portland limestone cement. It can be um, completely different cement formulations for concrete. And we need to have confidence in the long-term performance of these materials. And that goes back to getting consensus in the standards organization. What, what properties to be defined for these materials that are important and how do we test for them and how do we assure the users that they're going to get 
you know, the material they want and to have it perform the way that it needs to for a long period of time. That's an interesting challenge and I'd uh, love to hear your perspective on how to solve it in the next part of the uh, the panel discussion. Um, uh, and Sam, uh, you recently published an article discussing the carbon footprint in the concrete industry and benchmarking uh, for that matter. What are the challenges that you have identified in your research area? Sure. So when we think about the decarbonization of the construction industry, uh, we should see that from a different angles and it's a bit different from other industries. And uh, the, the main reason is that we have so many stakeholders in the construction industry and all projects involve many suppliers and subcontractors. This can provide an opportunity to synergize the efforts and improve the sustainability of the projects. But at the same time, we have to make sure that we can you know, keep track of everything and we have to uh, you know, provide effective tools to identify where to focus on data collections and improvement efforts among this uh, complex set of suppliers. The other important challenge is that no project is alike. In other words, uh, when, uh, when we see different types of buildings, they are obviously uh, different from a design perspective, but even if they have the same design, the site, and supply chains will differ. Therefore, the availability of the materials, the local energy supply, uh, all the upstream uh, processes would be quite different. And the other important factors that I've been, uh, you know, researching in the uh, past five, ten years is about the importance of the life cycle uh, environmental impacts or the sustainability impacts that. Uh, we have this opportunity as the construction stakeholders to reduce the embodied impacts, those emissions associated with the construction materials, production and construction uh, and maintenance and repair and end of life of our uh, buildings or built environment elements. But at the same time, we can use the properties of these materials like reflectivity, stiffness, uh, durability, mechanical performance to improve the whole life cycle uh, emissions uh, or um, economic aspects of our project. So thinking about uh, the sustainability from a life cycle perspective matters the most here and will give us a clear picture of uh, how much we can achieve and how much uh, we have already done. Great. Uh, thanks, Sam, uh, for sharing that, that feedback. And um, going to Greg, uh, if you had a magic wand, what is the biggest obstacle that you would like to remove? Uh, you, you, you're on mute. It, is it still on mute? Maybe the magic one needs to unmute. A magic wand, what a concept. Mm. I, let's start with this. The harsh reality of staying in business for material producers is participation in competitive bidding. It's a fact of life. Generally, these successful bids require a price optimized for delivery, not an infrastructure life cycle. So if I had a magic wand, I'd move people's horizon for planning beyond just doing the cheapest, least expensive cost optimization to install the immediate infrastructure. However, this requires significant capital investment. It's required to implement carbon reduction measures and it clearly puts the same sustainability on an economic disadvantage. The technological barriers that we talk about are part of the high cost structure. It's early days for new carbon reduction methods. Most remain less than fully proven. Many are very good and all are fairly labor intensive to support. So what the magic wand could do is change public indifference. The public indifference leads to a lack of political will to implement policies and regulations. And without these, we can't have a level playing field to reduce carbon emissions. This political will is needed to create a financial level playing field for sustainability. Hence the magic wand. The, the counters to this are resistance from well made established interests that are relying on carbon intensive stuff like fossil fuel industry and others. They're formidable barriers for politicians to the, uh, the level playing field. In the end, the environment is global. 
we can't get away from that and demands global coordination. Even if, as advertised, the nation of Norway can be net zero in 10, 10 years, as long as the developing world churns out carbon and methane in particular, we'll be no better off. The issue is a misalignment of core interest. We have to balance protecting the future versus prosperity now worldwide. And that magic wand that you gave to me just now, I'd use to help people demand change for the long term. Thank you. Right on, right on. Um, Korea, what are the risks for implementing sustainable practices? And obviously there are obstacles, but there are also risks that comes with that. Yeah, I just said that, uh, that the, I mean, uh, my answer is going to be very similar to Eric's answer, right? So yeah, the, the biggest risk, especially on the material side, right, construction materials are the long-term performance of them, right, technical risk, right? So because and we don't have enough time per se or accelerated methodology, right? So to look at the long-term uh, behavior of those new materials, new changes that we are implementing, and that's part of perhaps the uh, redundancy that we, I mean, uh, sorry, uh, the reluctancy that we see in the market that are not open um, to, to basically adopt uh, those new materials or new changes that we are, we are bringing, I mean, the industry bringing into the market. And that, that would be perhaps, uh, and the materials, so construction material, the biggest one. But of course, right, uh, yeah, people mindset is part of it too, right? If it's 100% safe, it's still the change management and also mindset shift is part of the obstacles that we need to overcome, right? And uh, and yeah, so, so some, some of them is understandable, right? Because again, there are not much data, experimental history on some of this technology. But the other part is a little bit culture of uh, industry, right? Industry culture that are very slow, risk reversed and uh, and sometimes honestly they don't want to change that they don't like change that much right so but again uh, i'm just uh, repeating what other people mentioned i don't have any anything completely new to add here yeah thanks Thank you, thanks julie uh have you seen people bring up cost or training as a challenge that prevents them from adopting green practices and you know in general what are the obstacles that you see in adopting uh, sustainable approaches Oh, absolutely. There's many obstacles out there. Uh, first and foremost, I would say the educational level of those that are specifying a lot of the sustainability requests. And part of that is, is if we look at our local departments of transportation, why they want to um, apply sustainability, they don't often do it because they are in silos per se in their own organization. And I would say not only at the departments of transportation, but when you look at the owner, the specifier, the people that are involved in a construction practice, they're all very siloed. So they do not talk together. And many of the things that we see are not integrated. For example, I want to have a concrete building and I want it, I think it's going to be sustainable. Yet the person that may be the engineer behind that is specifying concrete mixtures that are well above uh, the cementitious content that really needs to be used. So when we look at cement content as being uh, burdening to the CO2 footprint, again, the owner is stating his objectives as I want a sustainable building, but the architect or the engineer is not then calling that out in their specification. So we see a real um, disjointedness to the practice. Now, I'm also going to come back to the idea that while all of this can ring true, then you come down to the concrete producer. If the concrete producer does not have materials that can lend to lower carbon concrete mixtures, you're again right back where you started from. They can't produce a lower carbon concrete mixture because perhaps they don't have a fly ash or a slag cement or another supplemental cementitious material that can be um, exchanged for Portland cement in their concrete mixture. Or perhaps even if they tried to do that, to bring them in would be from um, an extraordinary distance. So again, now you have transportation that really is impacting your CO2 footprint on the site. So again, I look at it as there's a lot of things that need to have more alignment for us to become more sustainable in the industry as a whole. Thank you. Um, it seems that 
there are several obstacles in our road to, to green future. So let's discuss how we can address the challenges that you just identified and essentially the factors that you think can influence the sustainability changes. Uh, let's just start with Hassan, please. Sure. So uh, the we have multiple opportunities in the construction industry and particularly from an academic perspective, we can think about the education as the first and foremost uh, uh, you know, solution here. Thinking about how to uh, transfer all these uh, research outcomes and solutions that we found in our lab or uh, in our research works to the industry and to the younger generation of uh, engineers. I think that makes a uh, very significant changes. And uh, in general, if you think about our um, workforce and, and improving the internal capacity that they would be able to uh, assess the carbon impact of the, the construction firm or the, the project in general, I think this can make a, uh, significant changes. And <clears throat> Most importantly, if we, uh, in terms of communication, if we go one step further to uh, go beyond what we call information and enable or empower the industry to do their own analysis and to make their own decisions uh, uh, and optimize their solutions, given all these availabilities of data sources and uh, you know, experimental and historical uh, uh, data that is available uh, to make a meaningful decisions depending on the, the companies and the uh, project, the specific requirements. I think that makes a significant change. Exactly. And that's a, that's a very good approach to solving that um, problem. Um, Rick, unfortunately, we don't have a magic wand, so we have to practically address the mindset uh, change and shift in that area. What do you think can be done to add us that obstacle? Um, I believe you're speaking to me, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, these are significant obstacles, there's no doubt. In my humble opinion, to create change that sticks, it will require a partnership between two very unlikely bedfellows, politicians and technologists. Consider a good technologist solves puzzles. That's what we're built for. An excellent technologist solves puzzles that help mankind. And collected on this call are several of those. Now contrast that to this. A good politician finds an angry mob and jumps out in front. We've all seen that. But an excellent politician first creates an angry mob and then jumps out front. I think to solve these problems, to make this partnership work, we must instill social change that creates an angry mob demanding a greener world. And that will be the root at resolving these issues. I realize that's not a hardcore technical answer, but I do think that's our biggest obstacle. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Uh, Priya, what do you think is the practical or at least possible approach to addressing the, the obstacles that you identified? Yeah, no, I 100% definitely agree with uh, Craig, Craig's comment, right? So p political policymakers level, right? They they can help significantly, right? So kind of uh, helping the industry, right? Helping the industry making a long term decision, right? Not the short term. Although it might be more capital intensive, but a little bit longer view, especially for a politician side, right? So into the budget, into the policy they are making not for three years, four years, basically, kind of a period of time can significantly help from the practical, pre practicality, right? So that that 100%, I cannot agree more uh, with that comment. Uh, but, but the other side is perhaps technology, I mean, from technical side can help, as uh, Hesam mentioned that, right? So the availability of the data, right? Digitalization, availability of the data, leveraging, AI and even blockchain, for example, right, for traceability, right? So for, for now, I guess the biggest problem I see is greenwashing, for example, right? And Craig mentioned that we have one planet, right? We're quite often we see that they are shifting problem from one jurisdiction and transfer it to another jurisdiction, right? So, but I believe uh, technology help us uh, to become more transparent and also, yeah, enable us to, to do traceability or tracking things much, much better 
And that by itself can significantly help us from a practical point of view, right? So basically move the needle, right? So yeah, that, that's, that's another angle, right? So if you want to look at it from that lens. Great, great, great. Thank you, Priya. And Eric, you mentioned one of the challenges is consensus-based approach in the standards and uh, you know, guideline development. You know, that this is the way that we have been doing it for hundreds of years. And you know, how do you see we can change or move that obstacle so that we can develop guidelines and standards much faster? Ooh, that's a tough one. Um, and it's a really tough one because particularly in ASTM, which governs a lot of what we do with construction materials, um, it's, there's a very low barrier to entry to being on a standards committee. And once you're on, just about everybody has a vote. Uh, some other organizations have used a smaller committee approach and more tightly control the, the membership of the committees that are developing standards. Uh, the American Concrete Institute, for example, the code committee is uh, relatively limited in size for the most part. So to some extent, we have to limit the number of people that are arguing over these topics to get to consensus. And that is going to leave some people out, unfortunately, I think. Um, but that that's the reality of, of how these consensus standards approaches work. If, if only one side promulgates a standard, um, that leaves everybody else feeling left out too. So that, that's also a challenge, but we're seeing some of that uh, to some extent um, as the US government is trying to implement uh, things like the Inflation Reduction Act. So very recently, the General Services Administration released a draft standard for four different low embodied carbon construction materials and set global warming potential or embodied carbon limits on each of these different materials. And that's for the purpose of uh, their ability to use funding that's been allocated to them specifically for the purpose of buying these materials. But in order to do so, they need to define what they are. So you have to have a definition of what is low carbon steel, what is low carbon concrete. And those standards are kind of coming out in a one sided manner with uh, some opportunity for other stakeholders to respond and give input, um, but it's really coming out from the government side. At the same time, the you know, government can provide significant incentives, so they are in this case also acting as a buyer, of, uh, kind of a first buyer uh, for these products, saying if you can provide them, we will buy them, and and that's something the government has not often done. Thank you, Eric and Julie. Yes, thank you. I think there's many obstacles that we face in the industry. Um, one is the lack of education. I've come back to that many times, but it really is truly part of the issue is that why we may be educated at a, you know, at a, at an university and we may be educated from an industry level or industry association that doesn't necessarily trickle down to the ready mix producers or the concrete producers as a whole, or even the contractors, because they have very little education on sustainability as a whole. The other issue is that if we want to look very broadly and very globally at sustainability, it requires money and it's economically can be very challenging for a small producer or even a small country to change uh, the practices they have in place. So one of the obstacles I see and to overcome it would be to see subsidies, uh, subsidies to allow a producer or allow a country to help raise their a, education and awareness, but also maybe to update their equipment or update the kind of technology that they're presently using. As we know, we're very blessed in the United States to have some of the top level technology, but that's not true across the world. And really, sustainability is a global problem. It's a global issue. And we must work all together in the industry, no matter what level we're at, to ensure that we get there. So I would say um, until we see changes in, you know, subsidy at some point from the legislation or just looking at are they going to legislate and mandate throughout all levels of government 
that we must have sustainable construction. And I'm going to use this example is that I was recently at a local trustee meeting. I live in a township and their response is, I don't need to worry about it. That's the county's problem. But when you go to a county meeting, they go, that's not our problem. It's the state's problem. So we have to stop and say, globally, we're all responsible. And it's not just from the top down, it's more from the bottom up. And each group needs to take responsibility to put in place goals, um, where they want to be, you know, for sustainability in the in the interim, in the long term, and what they need to be successful to integrate these types of and pieces of information and the types of technology into their own uh, goals. Awesome. Thank you very much, Julie. Um, I guess we can also discuss a little bit more about this uh, on the next topic, which is related to technology and see how technology can help here. Um, technological advancements are happening at an exponential rate and construction industry needs to leverage this to become more sustainable. Uh, Greg, you have written several articles on the use of technology in the construction industry, including one uh, in the Concrete Construction Magazine entitled ROI of the Cloud a few years ago before this was a hot topic. What advancements have you have you see that have been made possible through these technological advancements and maybe in particular cloud-based technologies? This is a great question. Thank you. So first of all, there's many technologies that can be used to advance sustainability in our industry without doubt. Some are directly injected into the primary process, while others, and perhaps most importantly, are secondary, their support systems. First thing I'd like to throw out there, and these all articles that we put out in concrete products, um, is fight fire with fire. Direct injection of CO2 in plastic concrete does increase the strength, there's no doubt, and it reduces the high emitting Portland cement consumption. So we use less of the polluter and more of the non-polluting or low polluting. Next, in a recent article, we covered using graphene as a form of a carbon in a grinding agent for when we convert clinker to Portland cement. This increases strength and it allows a higher proportion of limestone, a low relative polluter uh, with a lower carbon footprint. Those are proven and working today. Now, we also can't forget secondary things, and top on that list is transportation technologies. Infrastructure is about aggregate and Portland cement, and it's heavy. The carbon footprint for transportation is huge, ginormous in a technical term. The CNG technology has helped quite a bit with companies like Ozinga and others putting that on the market. But even more gains are possible when we move towards electric vehicles and hydrogen fuel cells. But that's not in sight at this point. Advanced recycling technologies for brownfield rip and replace help recover valuable materials from the traditional landfill waste, another huge thing to limit our footprint. Perhaps the most important goes back to what Hassan has talked about and others. It's build with the future in mind. If we can transform our mindset into building information, like the building information modeling systems help us with BIM. We can identify we're using high strength, high quality concrete with a much longer surface life will absolutely reduce the carbon footprint of infrastructure over the long term. Also, making life cycle planning and cost per cost provisions a requirement for permitting will reduce the incentive to create throwaway infrastructure, such as yet another redundant strip mall that's going to be torn down in 10 years. The success of rip and replace for brownfield construction is a huge problem. In sort of summary, the design, we need to design for the life cycle of our, our buildings, if you will, and the structure included. Um, in the buildings, more energy efficient designs are here and they're proven. Building automation and control systems can help reduce that energy use by optimizing heating, cooling, and lighting. When combined with associated renewable energy technologies such as solar and wind, it can help reduce the dependence on fossil fuels and greenhouse gas emissions for the life cycle of the total building or infrastructure. I think in, in general though, the solution must be multifaceted. Technology is only one part and it covers so many other areas. So thank you. 
Thank you, Greg. Um, Maria, uh, what is the role of AI and IoT in today's modern concrete plants and job sizing? We see a lot of advancements in an artificial intelligence, industry 4.0, and so on and so forth. Where, how do you see this technology revolution is going to be implemented in the construction sector? So yeah, th thanks, Ali. Uh, as I briefly mentioned right in the previous question, right? So the impact eventually is a data play, right? So digitalization or data, right? So as we are gathering, collecting more data and uh, basically uh, to the extent that we can call it perhaps the big data, right? So and lever I mean, and, and that data gathering big data quite often requires some automation, right? So through the IoT sensor uh, and, and most of them are Kind of, yeah, needs to be by by nature cloud-based solution, right? So for IU, especially for data collection, and when we get to the big data, right? The next step, how to create the knowledge, right? So knowledge, information, clean data, information, and to create actionable uh, knowledge, basic out of the data, quite often is out of uh, the capacity of human being, right? So because there are lots of information coming in real time, huge amount. And there are lots of multifaceted kind of information, right? L lots of parameters that uh, even training, comparing with the very experts, expertise, right? So experienced person been doing that for years. It would not, be, you get to the point that it would not be possible, right? So that, you know, using the manpower to analyze the data and create knowledge in the real time manner. I guess that that's the point that we, we see that AI becomes very handy and also very effective practical solution, right? So to train the model, and not maybe in terms of intelligence as strong as a human being, for sure we are not there, but in terms of the speed, right? So I know something that can work 24, seven, to 24 hours, you know, seven days a week, right? To process huge amount of data in a portion of the second and yield basically uh, valuable uh, information knowledge that we can act on it. That, that, that's the way I see that, right? So data, AI, IoT, yeah, can play and bring value um, to the industry, right? But but that can translate to different pro things, right? Different value, productivity, reduce the cost, reduce carbon footprint, right? More sustainability, right? So there are different uh, outcomes we can get out of those technologies. Thank you, Priya. Um, Eric, um, you know, our industry is heavily regulated, uh, maybe rightly so because of the liabilities associated with something that goes wrong. Uh, and this makes changes happening relatively slower uh, in our industry compared to other industries. And you touched on about a, a, a few points related to how standards and guidelines are developed. Uh, and but but in, in your opinion, like how how should we or standards associations in general should promote innovation in the construction construction industry? What is the role of associations in that? So uh, the role of the association. Uh, Oh boy, we so we can pause and just kind of reset here. So, as an industry association, um, we have individual staff that actually participate in standard associations or standard organizations. Uh, but we can also go to our members and try to generate some internal consensus before we bring a proposal to a standards organization. And that consensus kind of helps avoid any conflict from association members when we introduce a proposal in the standards organization. Another thing that we've done that's been very successful um, in promoting uh, both innovation and kind of smoothing the introduction of new proposals is, uh, is a limited scope effort, but it's called the Joint ASHTO ASTM Harmonization Task Group. And this brings together members from ASHTO, which is uh, state DOTs in the United States uh, and their standards organization, and uh, members from ASTM, uh, some of whom are associated with PCA and others are not. Um, but it helps ensure that cement standards across these two different standards organizations are harmonized and that we don't publish a change in one organization but not the other and i know this seems like a small tweak but uh, by getting both of these organizations on board 
kind of before a proposal is formally introduced for balloting, we can avoid um, any differences that make it harder to do business down the line uh, by having different standards in these, these organizations for essentially the same product. And that's a definitely important approach, you know, that uh, yeah. you're thinking. Um, uh, Hassam, uh, you are uh, on the research side and obviously things are pretty much happening at a very accelerated rate, you know, uh, but from your perspective, what can be done to accelerate the technology transfer to from research projects to the industry practices? Absolutely. So, um, well, the fundamental question that I think is very relevant to our discussion here is that how can we measure it? Because if we can't measure it, we can't reduce it. And here we see the opportunities, this unique opportunities, thanks to the inexpensive sampling and data storage uh, because of the uh, you know uh, computational powers that we have available these days. Uh, we can really have a good amount of data to uh, you know, provide a benchmark values about what we have already emitted or what's the, the sustainability or the current level of sustainability in our firm or, for example, uh, the, the, the impacts associated uh, with our products. And then we can make a decision to how to reduce it. And this uh, reduction uh, comes with the capacity of developing different types of tools. And for different tools, uh, Apparently, we don't have a wide variety of expertise within each organization. Definitely, we need to uh, provide a process of streamlining the available tools and solutions because they are extremely complex and they need a lot of training. And we as, a, as a academic people, we should work on the, this streamlining process without compromising the robustness of the conclusion, most importantly, meaning that we deliver the uh, reduce the fidelity of the data, but at the same time, we make sure that the conclusion is not compromised. And here we can share our tools and we can uh, you know, have a bigger impact outside the academia and share it with other, st uh, other stakeholders down the stream. Hope that makes uh, sense. Thank, thanks, Hassan. Julie, um, as a consulting service provider, um, Sure, you uh, are aware of all the technological advancements that are happening in this area. How do you keep yourself up to date on these latest trends and the sustainable uh, approaches in, in the consulting world, for example? Well, I read an awful lot. <laughs> and <laughs> I mean, daily, I am obviously reading construction journals. I'm reading uh, technical journals. I have a background in science, so I'm very science based in my approach and looking at things. And I like to see what technology is not just in the United States, but throughout the world. For example, um, some of my colleagues in uh, Czechoslovakia are using dry joints so that they have buildings that can be constructed and then taken apart and moved and then reused. So that is something that we don't typically see here in the United States. So looking across the world, there's many things that are out there that are forthcoming. But again, here in the United States, we tend to like to use what we see here locally, which I don't always agree with. But also technically, I'm, I've am i done many, many things in technology transfer. And as engineers are extremely conservative in their approaches, they are tasked with the life safety of a building and ensuring that people egress out of that building so that they are very safe. However, I think they do not look at sustainability with that same rigor. For example, our ACI 318 building code is about life safety. And while it says you can adopt sustainability, it really has no avenues for you to do that. Whereas if we look at the model code 2020 that is in Europe, they are actually looking at life cycle costing. They're looking at life cycle assessment. They're looking at whole building assessment. And then they turn around and they say, what technologies can we use to measure these to a standard? And what is that standard? And while we do see EPDs, um, we all know whether we like it or not, that how we construct it really is centralized over the economies that come with that. So I like some of the technologies that are abroad a little bit more so than I see here in the United States. And then we look at the new materials that are coming in. And while I see them, they can be benchtop 
and they look great on the bench top in a laboratory, they're really not able to be um, used at a large scale project. So I get concerned when people get real excited about something where they see it in a journal and they go, oh, this is the greatest thing since sliced bread. Because then can you really apply it to a job site? And so I like to look at things extremely practical. Is what I'm looking at a new technology that is employable? Is it cost effective? Can it be implemented everywhere in the United States? Because in some cases, there's no building codes throughout the United States. You might be in areas that there is no building code. So without these, um, what I'm going to say, looking at it from a perspective that will it meet a code? Will it meet the life safety standards? Is it innovative? Can it be adopted um, across the U.S.? I'm very cautious about saying all of that is true for a technology until I see it as well vetted. It's been established. There's been a pilot project. And I know it truly works. Thank you very much, Julie. Um, perfect. So uh, we're going to the last topic. Uh, Greg, I'll start with you. Changing the order, just be trying to be mindful of your hardest talk, uh, if that's OK. Um, as the last topic of today's panel, uh, let's discuss how we can inspire companies in our industry to implement sustainable approaches. Greg, what advice would you give our audience? It's an absolutely fantastic question. It goes right to the heart of the issue. And while we're surrounded with computational advances in finally computer systems that can fulfill the promise of AI, very publicly apparent now, cloud-based solutions for software, technologies doing this and that in all sorts of areas, what is it that we need to do to inspire companies to implement change? I think it's a simple answer. And the answer is give give the people what they want. We, when we think about modern market-driven economies, these are the biggest and most robust in the history of the world ever. It's pretty amazing. Reducing the carbon footprint will only be successful if it is aligned with the market drivers of our economy. It's the only way we can do this. So while Adam Smith and John Maynard Keyes are the legendary economists that we operate by in almost all democratic economies, Al Capone, that famous gangster from the 30s, probably said it best. When asked why he did what he did, he said, I just give the people what they want. And I think that's very important here. Reducing our industry's carbon footprint requires us to inspire the people to want it, and then it will happen. Then they'll put the political pressure on their They'll demand it in the products they buy. This, to me, is the core of the solution. And we as technologists have to have the technology ready, as, as we've described in the last question. Um, less complicated to use, more clear benefits, et cetera. All of that's required. But we've got to get people to want to make this happen. So thank you. Thank you, Craig. Um, Maria, where should we start? Yeah, I guess that the, the place you can start, right, is our, our own organization, right? So I would say that, you know, like uh, the easiest, you know, way to start and also, yeah, just to start the culture change, right? Is, uh, yeah, within our own organization, right? So a small step, right? So it could be, yeah, developing our ESG, basically, right? The policy, right? The ESG policy for the organization. And start understanding our own carbon footprint or sustainability issue, right? In our organization, including the travel activities, right? So even culture of uh, paperless, right? So yeah, to, to avoid paper in our company, use more digital tools as we do, right? Today, basically, right? That's a great example, right? No travel, no extra, uh, non-necessary additional, um, carbon footprint or GHG emission, right? So yeah, I guess uh, to, to my opinion, this is the area that everybody can start, right? So, and also it's a small thing, but that would have significant impact. And the second thing, right? The share of sh success sharing, right? So a culture of sharing success, right? So if you find something, and, and I find that quite often in construction, we are living in silos, right? Construction company, even in, within one organization, they don't talk to each other, right? Each project, project managers, so the culture of sharing successes, right? If they are successful with one technology or something helping them, 
yeah, like through the education, through the media, right, webinars, or could be different outlet, right? So be more willing to share our, our success, all right? Because we don't have that much time, right? The clock is keep ticking 2013 and 2015. And as I guess Craig mentioned that, right, so uh, Eric, uh, the planet would, would would survive, right? So the Earth would survive. But the, there's a big question mark whether, you know, human beings can survive, right? If you don't act quickly, right? So, yeah, Earth will be there. But the, the bigger challenge is, you know, whether we can survive, right, on the Earth, right? If you put it into consideration, that creates a level of urgency to all, for, to, for all of us, right, including our, our organization and the rest of the industry, if they perhaps start thinking that, that way, right? Yeah. That's my two cents here. Thanks. Thanks, Ali. Eric, uh, what is a five or 10 year vision that can be inspiring? You're setting guidelines, the standards, and recommendations for this industry. So um, I think in the immediate term, we can begin by starting to focus or double down a focus on quality and performance uh, for concrete. So um, our quality control. For concrete producers, that really determines how much they have to over-design a concrete mixture to achieve a certain performance. And so the tighter your quality control, the less over-design you need to do, and therefore the less carbon footprint you can have associated with those mixtures. The more we focus on performance, um, the more we enable innovation. And finally, when you bring the two of these together, that helps us avoid rework on construction projects because that is the fastest way to double your carbon footprint is to have to rip out and replace something that you built. Going out five, ten years down the road, I think we want to look at, you know, greater use of renewable energy. Um, we want to look at starting to see the introduction of even new cements uh, for use in concrete and an increase uh, design and construction for eventual reuse. I think that's something that was brought up earlier to be able to repurpose structures rather than to throw them away and rebuild. Um, and lastly, uh, you know, just a couple places that folks can go for more information on this. Uh, NRMCA had great resources um, on their Build with Strength website, guidance on the best ways to reduce your concrete carbon footprint, how to improve specifications right now, right today. Um, and also I would recommend folks look at the contractor's commitment to sustainability. Uh, this is a new initiative that about 20, 22 contractors have signed on to already. And this isn't just about carbon footprint, this is about waste management and water management on construction projects as well, because that those are important con uh, components of sustainability as well. So I hope this is kind of the start of the path forward. Uh, for those of us that produce cement, um, we are going to be leaning a lot on carbon capture solutions to take us the rest of the way uh, to help eliminate some of the last and, and actually sizable amounts of emissions uh, for concrete production. Thank you, Eric. Definitely inspiring. Um, and last but not least, Hassam, you know, what role universities and academic institutions uh, have in inspiring the next generation of practice practitioners? Absolutely. So, uh, First of all, as we discussed earlier, education plays an important role just to make sure that sustainability practices and education is a part of the engineering programs in different schools um, and they're familiar with the basics and principles. So that helps a lot in terms of the implementation in the future uh, for uh, making our built environment more sustainable and, uh, you know, define the construction industry as a more sustainable supply chain, improve the productivity, most importantly. Uh, the second important aspect is uh, the technology that we discussed earlier, and uh, this is where academia can play a major role in lowering down the cost associated with innovative technologies. We see a lot of uh, solutions, more importantly, for example, in, in the context of carbon neutrality for carbon capture, utilization and storage. So these technologies are still uh, relatively costly compared to the other solutions and uh, you know, comparing to the marginal cost uh, uh, and benefits of different, uh, you know, stakeholders in the construction industry. We as an uh, as academic people can work on these technologies to lower down the cost and, um, you know, help with, uh, uh, you know, the acceleration of the uh, implementation. Thank you, Hassan. 
Julie, um, how can we turn green practices to common practices? That is a difficult topic, but I, I'm actually working on some of that right now. And some work I'm doing with some clients is that we're actually looking at how can they become the most sustainable contractor in the United States? Well, part of it is looking at how they bid projects. Um, are they educated about what is a green building practice or a sustainable concrete practice? And how do they walk the walk and talk the talk? And it's a lot more difficult than it appears. Why we can look at it from a very high level, from an, an industry level and from an educational level, actually putting it into operation with a contractor is much more difficult because they may have to purchase new equipment. Maybe they are not budgeted to have new equipment this year. Maybe they have to uh, educate their personnel. That means that that personnel might have to go get specialized instruction. Uh, just even so much as employing a new technology, uh, maybe it requires um, a longer schedule. Now, is that going to be allowable by the owner? And then if it's not allowable the owner and they must stay on the same construction schedule, then what does that mean? Do they need to wrap the project? And that's a lot more costly than just having the building project as it is. So it's a very difficult answer. It's not as simplistic as we'd like it to be. We just can't dictate code and say that they're going to do it. Um, it's not possible. Some of it is um, a little premature. I think there's new codes that are being uh, done right now, like ACI is going to have a new low concrete code forthcoming. But the building codes, people are always going to follow building codes. And unfortunately, people don't like to change. Whether we want to say that or not, people like to be very um, in their comfort zone. You're always going to have your leaders, but you're always going to have the laggards as well. And so with that, we have to find that happy medium. And again, I think it's incentizing for doing those projects. Um, maybe it's so much as saying, bringing the project in on time will get you a 20% bonus. We really have to think about the industry as a whole. And I think that's what's really missing is getting everyone in the same room together and saying what is really possible and what is not possible and being practical about those asks for sustainability. And uh, so that's about all the time we have. Uh, I want to thank our distinguished panelists uh, for sharing their expertise and insight on sustainable construction from green building materials to energy efficient uh, designs. Our panelists have highlighted the many innovative solutions available to reduce our environmental footprint. I hope this discussion has inspired our audience to take action towards a more sustainable future. Thank you for joining us today and let's work together to build a better world for the generations to come. Have a great day.